have done film. Yeah. You have done theater. Yeah. You have not done a lot of television. No, just some. I've done a couple TV movies. Yeah. And how was writing for a television movie? Well, a television movie was okay. Uh, but what was difficult, a couple times I've tried to write for, for episodics. And um, I would like street legal. And so they'd hire me and I'd come in and I'd bring in big guest characters and I'd ignore their characters, the, the Bible, because they, I found them the boring, you know. And, and so they'd say, yeah, that's fine, but where is our, our Carrie and our, you know, all these? And so it just doesn't work for me. So they, they say, Judith, no, we're not going to go with that script? Or well, Judith I think one was too harsh. They liked it, but it was too harsh. But also, um, and I just wasn't that interested in... in, in writing to form. And it's not that I don't, I, 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 I don't disrespect people who do. It's hard and it's, it's a good job and you know that's why I chose to teach though in the end. I was doing a lot of film. I'd be juggling, I think my name, like Hannah right now, my name, like Hannah Moscovich, my name was in some sort of pool and I was called constantly and I was, uh, we'd be juggling about eight projects at once. But I was totally being demoralized and my voice was being corroded as a writer. And you'd have to just think, ka-ching, I have all these small children, I have to make money, and I find myself desperately pitching stupid ideas to people who sat there because I needed the job, I needed the money. So you pitched story ideas for Oh, series? everything. I did everything I could think of. And, uh, and I wrote a couple of features as well, and, and uh, that was interesting. But then when I got the opportunity to have this job teaching, at first I was pretty blasé about it, not being a person who thinks, you know, consequences. And uh, thank God for it, because I get to share what I love. My work is considered my research, so it's valued. Uh, and it, it's, it's just great. It gives me the opportunity to do things for free. I mean, the first year of Rare was to completely just volunteer. And you and don't like writing to form? Or form I don't like writing someone voice. else's form uh, or someone else's characters. Not interested. I, wow. I need to create my own and it needs to be on fire. I can do it, but it feels like an assignment. Just like sometimes you might have noticed that, you know, you have playwrights you love and you see a play that slightly disappoints you and, you, and then you learn it's been a commission. Right. Haven't you found that? And the juice is sort of missing. Right. It's well done, competent, but the juice is missing. And that's something we have to balance. So who sets the form? We're talking mainly network drama here. We're not talking cable. We're not talking yeah. HBO, yeah. though that has its own oh, form yeah. as well. But main, we're talking network television, whatever. Oh, I think the ads do. It's, you know, eight acts. The people who run those shows know all that. People like Maureen Brebner would know all that now. She, I think she runs Rookie Blue. Um, eight acts, and something has to happen by this act. And you have to have, you know, and all those terrible Robert McKee screenwriting textbooks. Um, of you have, you introduce the world, you have to have an inciting incident by page 17, you know all that. Um, and the, the, it, the builds, there's a twist, there's another twist, there's the unexpected, there's the climax, there's the, you know. Um, but they like own the marketplace. Yeah. They own the center part of the narrative spectrum. Yes, they do. Most of the world goes home and watches CSI. Or Unbelievable. Whatever. What is our thirst for violence? What about The Walking Dead, the most popular show on television? You know what it reminds, have you ever seen it? No. I oh, you should, it. you should, because just sociologically you should. Because it's survival, it's post-apocalyptic, everybody's a zombie who dies. You die, right. you turn into a zombie. And so what it really is, it's just like pornography is, you know, there's a little bit of dialogue and then to the sex. and the dialogue, There's a little bit of dialogue and then it's always to the killing the zombies. So the zombie comes and they have an ax and they split the head in half. They cut the head off. They stuck it through the heart, and that's what people are waiting for. And I was reminded of Rwanda, because in Rwanda, they, the Hutus were taught to, to call the Tutsis cockroaches. Cockroaches are slow. They keep coming like zombies, but they're slow, and you can kill them pretty easily. Right. And you don't mind cutting them in half or something. And also, the people were cut at their ankles so that they couldn't, they walked like zombies and bleeding because right. when they were still alive, they cut them so they wouldn't move and they'd come back and finish them off. And so I'm just thinking, oh my God, this is training us to be entertained by this and this muscle of denial I'm talking about, it's okay, even though this was a sweet little girl yesterday and she died, you've got to kill her because otherwise she's going to eat you. 
Right. So it's training us to be an army. And that's how you train, you know, just like British boarding schools were really all about training the boys to be cruel. They had to be, be obey orders, be callous, be cruel, because then you'd be good in the army, you'd do well. And uh, this just frightens me. I see a hidden agenda in a lot of a lot of television. And I understand that, in fact, the Pentagon, we're having lots of meetings with Hollywood producers and screenwriters. That's, that's a fact. And look at 24. The, the agenda there is just yeah. right out in the open. You know, I find the agenda of most cop shows, detective shows, and CSI shows yeah. is, in fact, those who restore society to its well-being right. are, in fact, come with authority, they come with violence, they come with power. That's right. They come with That's guns. Right. There's no doubt. They solve it themselves. Yeah. There's no collective action. There's no community no. action. That's right. And this group with the guns, the power, and the authority, and the richness, because they CSI, they're all well-dressed, they're yes, all well very much so. corrupt, they've Groomed, all got the hair, great yeah. departments yeah. and large cars, they're romanticized as well. So the romanticized yeah. use of authoritarian with violence and all knowledge, because they can yeah. then solve societal ills one That's after right. the That's other. That's right. That's true. It's That's a fascist a political kind of, agenda. Yeah, you know? it is. It is. It's not a collective action. I mean, Agatha no. Christie is collective action. She no. tries to figure it out with the community. That's right. So there is a... And the candy for the audience, beautiful dead girl. Yeah. You know, that's their candy. And that the cops have the straightened hair and the, you yeah. know, all of a certain look. And yeah. it's just so because you teach and you teach writing and young writers come up, are you worried that the world that they go into as writers, there's the main narrative aspect of our world, which is formulaic, driven by these Bibles, and oh yes, you want to create go and work on that small theater over there. That the creators, it feels to me like the creators are being marginalized. Certainly in, in most television, in that kind of television, yeah, except for the HBO where it's all about the, the, the writer, creator, showrunner. But no, I, f I say to them, you know, remember starving artists and garrets, don't, don't ever expect to make a living. But if you write one play, one monologue that's on at a fringe and 800 people see and are penetrated by, are moved and changed by, and you can be proud of that your whole life. That's a miracle. And we who are lucky enough to stay on and keep writing more, and I, I don't know if you find, but I find as I get older, when, when I was younger, if I had one failure, it was the end of the world, the end of me. Um, and now you just look at the whole oeuvre, like our whole everything that we do and you have to go down different roads and you have to make those mistakes to find this kind of thing. Uh, but I just think one great piece is an absolute miracle, a piece of art. Every real piece of art is a miracle and be thankful for that and if they can create that and be true to their values and their stories which are amazing. I always get them to tell stories at the beginning of class and they're always a hundred percent jaw-dropping and these 21 year olds in fact, right after Margaret Wente had written a column saying that rape culture is all bogus and there's no such thing, I had that first class. Seven of the girls had those stories about being raped in Frosh Week. I just wanted to take and send it to Margaret Wente and say, no, there's no rape culture. I appreciate your optimism. And I guess I want to say, have we not, because I can be a pessimist, have artists of our age not inherited, we lived the sweet spot, where the culture made space for us. Yeah, they did. To build a theater, to write a play, to have a play in a small place. And that the world that the young writers are going into now is not that sweet space. That the relative amount of funds that are coming from public bodies and whatever to keep the creative edges going is shrinking in proportion to the whole thing, in to the whole narrative universe. And our narrative universe is occupied by the main narrators, which are network television dramas, network television ads, network television news. So while we were afforded the possibility to explore all these things as young artists and middle-aged artists, the young generation in your class are not going to have that. Am I being overly pessimistic? I here? think you are, because I look at my can scene that arrives uh, in my inbox, and there are competitions and theaters. You're looking for work for young people, 
And if it's your vocation, your passion, that's what you will pursue and that's what makes you happy. I remember saying in a rehearsal hall, my partners and I, we looked at each other and said, there is nowhere we would rather be. This is so extraordinary. And yes, the fun thing, because Rare was all very well, it was for the fringe and we did it for free. And then we got some, a little bit of money and we were able to pay people. And for instance, for this wheelchair project, we got a, did get a Trillium grant for the first workshop. And we are waiting for the second. And But pardon me yeah. to be a little pessimistic here. Here's Judith Thompson. Yeah. There's your career. There's your skill at writing. There's your track record. And here you are doing a project called Rare, and you're waiting for a little bit of money? Yeah. I, I don't, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't. I, but here's what I do That's have. dark clouds on the horizon but here's, for me. here's the positive thing. You're so positive. I Albert this. Schultz, you know, whatever people's doubts, well, he's pretty amazing. He saw Rare. He called us down. We thought maybe he'll remount it or something. And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, but I want you to do a four or five year residency and you create these plays every year. I will give you three free rehearsal space and a free theater and ushers and publicity. And, all, and you just give us 50% of your box and you have to pay your soft costs. And I just thought, that's a visionary. That's incredible. Right. And of course I said, yes. And I'm 59 and we've, I've just created a company. I know all these 20 year olds are doing it all the time. But I never thought I'd take the reins like this. Right. And I have amazing partners, one very young and one in my age. And we have created it and we're doing it. And I'm as optimistic as ever. I feel like I'm just starting out. I like that gesture. <laughs>